This program is brought to you by Emory University. Um, I'm going to start us off briefly just by um, actually introducing our actual welcoming speaker. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor this morning to be able to introduce Provost Earl Lewis, who will be kicking off our festivities today. Um, I'm going to keep this short. As many of you know, a complete introduction of all of his many accomplishments would put us way behind schedule before we'd even gotten started. Um, briefly, Earl Lewis is Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs and the Asa Griggs Candler Professor of History and African American Studies. Before joining Emory, Provost Lewis served as Dean of the Horace H. Rackham School of Graduate Studies and Vice Provost for Academic Affairs Graduate Studies at the University of Michigan, which happens to be my alma mater. There he was the Elsa Barkley Brown and Robin D.G. Kelly Collegiate Professor of History and African American Studies and formerly Director of the Center for Afro American and African Studies. He has authored and edited numerous award-winning books, including In Their Own Interests, Race, Class, and Power in 20th Century Norfolk, his work has offered nuanced and sophisticated sociopolitical histories of black life that not only placed blacks at the center of their own history, but also was part of a wave of scholarship that changed the way we think about modern American life. In addition to his own distinguished record of scholarship, Provost Lewis also has a very long record of supporting junior scholars, and even today, as I've witnessed myself, with all the responsibilities of his current role, he still manages to make time to support colleagues and former students. Nationally, Provost Lewis has been a leader innovating and thinking through how to build diverse institutional contexts that nurture scholarship and encourage grappling with difficult questions. It is only fitting that he is here today to begin our conversation. Please join me in welcoming Provost Lewis. Amanda, that was actually uh, very nice. Thank you. It's always you wake up in the morning and go, that's sort of recognize the person being described. Uh, it, it is indeed a, a pleasure to welcome you uh, to this convening. Let me start by first thanking the organizers, and I know uh, Tyrone will uh, probably extend even uh, more thanks to others who uh, have been contributing to bringing us together today. But the uh, leaders of the Race and Difference Initiative, uh, Amanda, uh, you just met uh, Tyrone Foreman, uh, Dorothy Brown, Martha Feynman, Leslie Harris, uh, their work and uh, continuing to be in conversation and dialogue as we have uh, had this uh, particular initiative go through several different uh, phases of, of leadership uh, and conceptualization over the last five years. And I say thank you in part because as we go back and particularly for our visitors to understand that the Race and Difference Initiative is actually part of the university's overall strategic plan. Uh, when I arrived in 2004 uh, from Michigan, I was part of a leadership uh, group, including faculty and staff and administrators, uh, that worked uh, for the better part of a year in trying to uh, think through w the areas in which we actually have some assets already in place and if we can figure out how to bring them together uh, in a particular forms and, and manners. We may be able to actually not only uh, engage in convenings, but the net result of those convenings will be uh, new communities of scholarship uh, and new uh, areas of scholarship that actually would actually unfold. And so I'm sitting here uh, today uh, realizing that this symposium uh, is one part of an overall process that moves us forward. Convening is very important. It allows us to establish then some sense of the parameters of what we know, what we think we know, what we should know, and how we go about knowing something else. And so we bring together then scholars from inside of this institution and scholars from outside of this institution to be engaged in conversation and dialogue and even debate. And so that convening function is a very, very important one as we move this overall project forward as we try to anticipate where we will be and what we should be doing, not only in the near term, but in the long term. Because convening is part of then a process of deepening, to understand and to pose questions, to begin to ask, are there new kinds of configurations and new ways of puzzling through questions of both race and of difference and their intersections. And so it's an examination both uh, vertical and horizontal so the ways in which we put together knowledge, ways in which we imagine then we conceive this knowledge. But if convening and deepening are important, also is institutionalizing, beginning to think through what kinds of structures make sense as we move forward. 
And so as we listen to our colleagues, particularly from uh, outside the institution, sharing with us their own perspectives on the institutional structures and programs and c concepts that have worked elsewhere and how and in what ways we actually may benefit from their experiences and what ways may we actually go about creating something uh, new and that actually advances what we're trying to achieve here as we work on those horizontal and vertical interactions and intersections. And then finally, is that aspect of this particular convening, from convening to deepening to institutionalizing, we then get to uh, that piece that I was talking to Troy Duster about last night, which is transforming. The, the, the part of me that is both the, the provost and the scholar is, is that I like convening. I even like deepening. I don't even mind institutionalizing. But in the end, in the academy, it comes to then whether or not we're actually producing a new research that transforms the ways in which we understand the world. And if we actually engage in the first three and ignore the last, uh, we have failed in my view. And so what I think that we're about here is also creating a platform for making sure that uh, the convening and the deepening and the institutionalizing are part of a process that leads to the transforming and the transforming of the body of scholarship that we understand. Something as I supposedly known, I used to actually uh, <clears throat> play a little game with my students when I was teaching undergraduate courses both in African American studies and history. And we'd be talking about race and race as a social construction. And I said, so how many of you have ever played what I call the racial guessing game? And they said, what's the racial guessing game? I said, when you're walking down the street and you see someone who's ambiguous, and all of a sudden before you realize that you're trying to put them into a box, and you have a scale and a range, and there's always one person who would say, no, I've never done that. And, I'll, and I kept thinking, you're interesting. I really want to spend a little time understanding how. But 99% of folks actually did. And as we know, that part of socializing means then that the concept of race in that particular instance is something in that we all think we know something about. We have a vocabulary that we think we can use, and we employ that vocabulary to engage in social action, to make laws, to prescribe who and what, when and where people can engage one another. And in the end of the day, we are now in the 21st century with new technologies and new tools, and we ask ourselves, does that vocabulary work in the same way? Is it freighted with the same meaning? Do we, as scholars, have a role in exploring and perhaps transforming some ways in which we actually take what we think we know and ask new questions? And so I welcome you today to be part of that process of convening, deepening, institutionalizing, and ultimately transforming. Welcome to Emory. Good morning. Um, my name is Tyrone Foreman. I'm a faculty member in sociology here at Emory, and I'm also one of the co-leaders of the Race and Difference Initiative. Um, before I get started, though, I would be remiss if I didn't thank three special people who really made this possible. Um, Michelle Mano and LaRonda Barnes are graduate students here at Emory, respectively in the Candler uh, School of Theology, as well as the Sociology Department. And it's really their yeoman-like work on behalf of the Race and Difference Initiative that really made this program possible. Um, in addition, our uh, staff person, wonderful staff person, financial administrator, and general expert on all that's need to be known about Emory, Karina Domazek, uh, really uh, has helped uh, marshal this forward in important ways. And I just want to publicly thank you. Uh, thank you, Michelle, and thank you, LaRonda. On behalf of the leadership team of Race and Difference, and there are five of us, uh, Professor Brown in the School of Law, Martha Feynman also from the School of Law, my colleague in sociology, Amanda Lewis, and uh, my colleague in African American Studies and History, Leslie Harris. I want to welcome you here today uh, to this fall symposium entitled Exploring Race and Difference at Emory, Mapping Current Research, and Charting Future Directions. 
Before I say a little bit about why we convened this symposium, I want to take a moment to describe the mission and goals of the Race and Difference Initiative for you. In part, I want to do this because this is a reiterative process that we're going through in trying to figure out the ways in which we can do uh, achieve the kinds of uh, goals that Provost Lewis just spoke about so eloquently. RDI's mission is to promote understanding and to generate new knowledge about how race and difference is, uh, plays out, intersects uh, in important ways in an increasingly diversifying world. Um, and what we've done over the past year in trying to think about the ways in which we can really have an impact here internally at Emory, but also beyond the campus borders, is we've identified five goals that we believe if we achieve those goals, we will go a long way to achieving um, the long-term goal of transforming not only how we understand the world, but also the institution uh, here at Emory. And so I just want to spend a little time talking about those uh, because I, I, we're hoping that part of the conversation we'll have today and uh, later this semester is really thinking about these goals and the ways that we can actualize them as a community of scholars uh, and students and staff here at Emory. Um, one of the ways we want to achieve this mission is by we've identified five of these goals and the first three are fairly clear cut uh, create a culture of collaboration and a climate of inclusion at Emory and one of the ways we hope to do that is by convening symposia like the one we have today which I will speak about uh, in a second the agenda for it. Uh, the building intellectual density in the study of race and difference here at Emory our agenda there is really the sort of how do we broaden uh, the contributions that many of us are making in our various departments, our various units around the question of race and difference. But how do we sort of meld those together so that we actually have, get a larger bang for our buck and our investment? And one of the ways that we hope to do that um, is by sponsoring, um, convening not just symposias where we talk to each other, but also a lecture series. We have, and some of you will have received, we, we sponsored this year a New Frontiers in Race and Difference lecture series that has as its goal to bring both up and coming and well-established scholars to Emory who are really thinking about race and difference in creative and innovative ways and to have them in conversation with us so that, and our students so that we can sort of advance uh, knowledge in the critical area of race and difference. Uh, and then the third goal that's related to building intellectual density is we have to train the next generation of scholars. There are many uh, students at Emory who are interested in questions both at the undergraduate and graduate level, the question of race and difference, and how do we really harness their energy and excitement for these questions in ways that sort of generate new knowledge as we sort of talked about earlier. The fourth goal that we have is to institutionalize race and difference in Emory. That is, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, when the faces in this room, the faces on this campus uh, change, is there a way in which we can, without 100% certainty, of course, but with maybe perhaps 80% certainty, make sure that the questions that we're raising today and that we're talking about today and for the remainder of this academic year, do those persist in the absence of uh, the many uh, voices and faces in this room. And one of the ways we've talked about doing that, and there are many of them, but I'll just highlight one for you, uh, is we're interested in building, and we've just begun the legwork on thinking about developing a graduate certificate in race and difference. That's a way in which we can, in a very, with a very small investment, bring together the already existing strengths here at Emory around questions of race and difference and really have an impact on the curriculum. Uh, and really sort of just make sure that the graduates, at least at the, gra at the graduate level, our students have an imprint as kind of leaders in questions of race and difference, independent of their disciplinary uh, training. And then finally, I think ultimately we can do all of this work uh, about building race and difference here and new knowledge. But I think ultimately one of the key goal, core goals of the strategic initiative is not just to generate new knowledge, but to help that new knowledge 
trickle out into the world and actually have an impact on critical, complex questions that our society is confronted with, that people look to universities uh, uh, to get answers to. And one of the ways that we're attempting to do that, and I'll just give a, a couple of brief examples, is we're trying to build bridges across the various universities uh, uh, in the Atlanta metropolitan area. I mean, there are, Atlanta's amazed and, and really blessed with wonderful institutions of higher education. And with the leadership of Ozzie Harris, the Vice Provost for uh, Community and Diversity here, we have an Atlanta consortium of colleges and universities, and we've begun to have a conversation across our campuses to talk about these critical questions of race and difference. And then finally, we're trying to figure out ways uh, to sort of bring um, individuals who may not necessarily uh, find the support necessarily in their unit or their university, but how do we build those bridges so that people who are interested in these questions can have a, a clear path to identify the key faculty, students uh, in the Atlanta metropolitan area to explore these issues. This is, as you might imagine, a large task. Um, and in some ways, we've, I think, bitten off a lot. But I think it's important to, to think large and to think boldly. Uh, and in, fa in fact, we only achieved three of the five goals in the next three to five years. I think we'll be well on the path uh, to making sure that race and difference is institutionalized here at Emory. Let me say a little bit about the Fall Symposium and why we convened it. With the support of Provost Earl Lewis, uh, who we thank uh, uh, for his immediate and unwavering uh, commitment to helping Emory community become a leader in confronting the human condition, the Race and Difference Initiative faculty, co-leaders, uh, and a number of other individuals and units across campus developed plans for this fall symp symposium. And in part, we developed we wanted to do this fall symposium because we think that RDI should provide special opportunities for scholarly exchange among Emory students, faculty, and staff um, around critical issues of race and difference. And part of the agenda that we have for the race and difference uh, for the fall symposium is to begin important conversations among and between ourselves internally at Emory to highlight the creative and innovative work currently being done on campus, and also to set an agenda for where we should be heading in the future. So while you will hear lots of work, uh, lots of um, ongoing work that various faculty are doing and that various of our, our campus leaders are engaged in here at Emory, our hope is that this is a beginning conversation, not an end point. Uh, and we hope that the panels and presentation generate these discussions and future collaborations. Um, in part because we believe that scholars and thinkers at a major university, we are obligated to be a site of serious thinking, assessment, and sense making when faced with complex issues. We have launched a lecture series, and I want to say a little bit more about this, in part because one of our speakers in the, in the lecture series will be here on Monday. That's Kathy Cohen, and we're sponsoring that in conjunction with the studies in sexuality. Uh, Kathy Cohen is a deputy provost at the University of Chicago, but really a national and international leader on thinking about questions of intersectionality, in particular questions related to race and class and sexuality. Um, and so I want to encourage you all to come to the next uh, speaker in the New Frontiers and Race and Difference Lecture Series, I believe in this room on Monday at 4.30 uh, p.m. Um, what we hope to do uh, is ultimately through these sets of conversations, the New Frontiers and Race and Difference Conference, the Fall Symposium, and the range of other activities that we have uh, arranged for this academic year and in the future, is to ultimately try and deepen an appreciation for the conceptual lenses and vocabularies necessary if we as scholars and as concerned citizens are ever to come to grips with the, and work with to resolve the ways in which class inequality, racial inequality, gender inequality, and sexual orientation intersect and drive wedges between people. We invite all of you 
uh, to join us today in this conversation as we begin it and really encourage you uh, to participate actively throughout the fall and, and spring as we continue this conversation. Thank you very much. Um, I have the pleasure of um, doing the introduction today, so you'll be seeing a lot of me jumping up and down. Um, it's actually one of the fun things to get to talk about um, some of the wonderful people that we have joining us here today. Um, in addition to the many um, uh, amazing Emory faculty that we have talking today, um, we also invited three distinguished visitors um, from outside to come and join us, people that in their own ways, on their own campuses, not only are doing a lot of um, intellectual leadership on these issues, but also a lot of institutional leadership. And we hope to learn from them, not only in terms of the kind of scholarship they're doing, but also the ways on campus they've managed to help build community around these issues. And first today is um, Dr. Keith Waylou. Keith Waylou is the Martin Luther King Jr. Professor at Rutgers University. He holds appointments in the Department of History and in the Institute for Health, Healthcare Policy and Aging Research. He is a leading expert on the cultural politics of disease in America. His work focuses principally on the ways scientific and technological understandings have interacted with politics, society, and culture to shape health experiences, disease disparities, and social responses to disease. His award-winning books include The Troubled Dream of Genetic Medicine, Ethnicity and Innovation in Tay-Sachs, Cystic Fibrosis, Sickle Cell Disease, Dying in the City of the Blues, Sickle Cell Anemia and the Politics of Race and Health, and Drawing Blood, Technology and Disease, Identity in 20th Century America. Professor Waylou's research has been supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, and the Burroughs Welcome Fund. In 2007, he was elected as a member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. Dr. Waylou is also the founding director for the Center for Race and Ethnicity at Rutgers, a center devoted to facilitating interdisciplinary research and en enriching education on matters of race and ethnicity. The center regularly organizes dynamic conversations on topics ranging from the question of race and vulnerability in the story of Katrina to the role of race and ethnicity in criminal justice to understanding Hispanic identity in the new millennium. Colleagues at Rutgers rave about his leadership of the center, including as one who's here today recently told me, arguing about who holds the title of the president of the Keith Waylou fan club. <laughs> Professor Waylou's contributions to our understandings of the politics of race and disease are invaluable for a number of reasons, not least because they demonstrate the importance of history, of understanding where we come from, in order that we bring to our analysis of the present a richer, more informed understanding of the stakes involved. Please join me in welcoming Professor Waylou. Okay, well, thank you very much for that glowing and uh, wonderfully comprehensive introduction. Uh, it's only downhill from here, right? Um, let me say thanks to Provost Lewis and also the co-leaders of the Race and Difference Initiative for the invitation to talk a little bit about myself and the work that I do. Uh, principally, I'll be talking about uh, the organizational and institutional work that I've been doing at Rutgers on this, as a founding director of the Center for Race and Ethnicity. But I didn't come to this through uh, by, by uh, coincidence. It, I came to it because of the academic trajectory, my own intellectual trajectory. So, so I thought I would talk a little bit about that. Uh, my undergraduate major was in chemical engineering. Um, I ended up uh, working as a freelance science writer for a while, and then I went to graduate school in itself a, multi a cross disciplinary program called the History and Sociology of Science. So we have like three different approaches to knowledge represented in that program. Um, my first position after, after finishing the PhD was in the uh, Department of Social Medicine, itself a kind of a hybrid cross-disciplinary program in the School of Medicine at UNC Chapel Hill. And I was also jointly appointed in the History Department. And I guess what I'm saying is that from really my origins as an undergraduate student all the way through my early career, I always existed in these interesting spaces where one, were, one was supposed to master the knowledge and the methodology associated with a discipline, but one was also supposed to be able to develop 
a, a, an ability to converse with other members of disciplines, with other disciplines about the significance of that work. And to do that in, in the case of social medicine in the context of a, of a school devoted to training medical students uh, in interacting with physicians. I did that for about nine years and you know, I, I really enjoyed and, and grew in that and I saw my work grow and thrive in the context of that converse, with that con conversation. And I moved in 2001 to Rutgers to join the history department and also to become part of an institute for health and healthcare policy and aging research. The emphasis being mostly on health and healthcare policy and not so much on aging research. Uh, I think Ellen might agree with me on that. Um, but there, you know, interacting with sociologists and health policy scholars also expanded and deepened the kind of work that I do. Um, and then finally, about three years ago, I became part of um, this new initiative, the founding director of this Center for Race and Ethnicity. So you can see that a lot of my interest in cross disciplinary conversation, stretching and expanding the, the significance of knowledge and academic work specifically on race and ethnicity continues to be part of what I do uh, organizationally and also academically. So let me say a little bit I'm at work right now on a book called How Cancer Crossed the Color Line, which just to kind of exemplify that the building the center hasn't distracted me entirely. It has a little bit, I was telling Troy. This book should have been out maybe two years ago. But um, it's a history of the changing burden of disease and the changing awareness of disease differences and of race and, gen and, the, and of racial and gender theories of disease. And what I've always found in my work is that what I need to know is not just uh, African American history to do these kinds of uh, work. I need to know a lot about uh, the history of epidemiology. I need to know a lot about the history of cancer in particular. And, and uh, to, to do this in a thorough and comprehensive way, one needs to marshal many different insights from a number of different disciplines. So it ends up being a history of population and epidemiological categories of difference, their uses and misuses. And I look at very closely the kind of the transformation of the categories we use for, for classifying individuals, for classifying diseases, and, how, and the process by with, which that changes. Now, as I've been doing my own historical work, I've also had this sort of con co collaborative, these are some images associated with the book, I've uh, been also interested in collaboration. And so I've edited a number of volumes uh, that focus on bringing many disciplinary perspectives to bear on unfolding contemporary issues in the biomedical sciences. Uh, in 2006, for instance, um, I co-edited uh, a book entitled A Death Retold, Jessica Santillan, The Bungle Transplant and the Paradoxes of Medical Citizenship. And this is a story of an undocumented Mexican immigrant girl who died in a Duke University hospital a number of years ago after receiving a mismatched uh, blood type heart lung transplant. And it became a kind of, for a very brief time, a touchstone for a number of controversies. One on error in medicine and the toll that error was taking. Two on the, 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 the the place of undocumented immigrants in the healthcare system, and thirdly, on the question of how do we allocate such scarce resources anyway, each of which has its own sorts of politics. Um, and what I find interesting is that we, in we involved transplant surgeons in that, we involved uh, anesthesiologists, we involved sociologists of error, we involved immigration specialists, and the whole idea being that to really understand this case, one needed more than just me. Uh, we needed a number of different perspectives, and my job was to sort of marshal expertise in service of a book that really reads like a book rather than a series of you know, disjointed essays. We're doing another project that's coming out next year on the HPV vaccine controversies and their relationships to ideas about sexual risk, not just in the United States, but across Europe and globally. Uh, and this is another example of the way in which a lot of my research really takes contemporary events and tries to bring scholars together to, to engage with them. And this is really the, you might say, the outlook that led me to think about the Center for Race and Ethnicity. Now, let me say a little bit about the center and why I thought that I should devote some time to it. There's a historical backdrop here, which is that I chaired a, a search for a, um, for uh, uh, well, actually, well, I, I, I convened a number of meetings uh, in, in, in the effort to attract a, a sort of a big name African American scholar to campus. And we, we staged these big lectures, like the ones that you're, you stage, and pulled in large audiences. Um, and the search, of course, was, uh, not of course, but it was unsuccessful, as searches often tend to be. Um, but what it, what it really showed us is that there was this wide-ranging interest in the issues that these scholars were bringing to our campus. And so when the Dean of Arts and Sciences asked me if I would chair this search again, I said, well, rather than chair the search, what I detected was that many of these senior scholars 
identified this breadth and this depth and this wide span of interest in, in the topic of race and ethnicity on the campus, but there was no institutional place, no single place where all this energy could be brought together. So rather than chairing the search again, I thought it would be better for us to try to build this center that clearly our own faculty wanted, but, and that then we should try to attract a senior scholar to run it, to direct it, to help guide it. And the dean, to her, you know, to her, to her credit, really thought this was a great idea. And so uh, thus began the Center for Race and Ethnicity. And it began with two things that I'll start to talk about and I'll end by talking about, which was a faculty forum, as in we issued a call for papers. And we said, anybody who works on any aspect of race and ethnicity, particularly young faculty who just arrived here and want to talk about their work, just we're doing a session on October you know, 15th, uh, call for proposals. And a flood came in. They came in from different parts of the campus, from psych parts of campus I didn't even know existed. Um, <laughs> faculty, some of whom were writing because they felt isolated, some of whom were writing because they saw this as a, they had a pent up desire for this kind of conversation. And all we did was organize the conversation in a meaningful way into panels. And we tried to group them so that they didn't replicate disciplinary norms. We didn't put all the historians over here. And this was, we mixed and matched. And what came out of it was a really vibrant discussion. Well, what do you do with discussion? So we founded this center based on the idea that, well, at the very least, we should start with discussion. And then we should see where it led. I think unlike your initiative, we didn't have a a, a, a plan from the very beginning. We had the desire to bring people together. So one of the things we do is we organize panels, lectures, uh, we have now do film screenings, we do forums, these annual faculty forums, in order to simply promote interdisciplinary engagement with issues of race and ethnicity in the state, in the region, and around the world. Uh, and so convening is a big part of what we do. The audiences we discover are in the, come to include students, they come to include educators, the faculty themselves, they come to include graduate students, and they also come to include members of the broader New Brunswick and Central Jersey community. If you show a film on the Afro-Columbian, uh, the politics of Afro-Columbian displacement, lo and behold, Afro-Columbians who live in New Brunswick show up to the film and engage in a robust back and forth with the students there about what this film means and how it should be read. We draw researchers then into the collective conversation about issues of contemporary and public policy as issue, uh, pu public policy concern, and we try to foster collaboration and innovation on the basis of those convenings. And so what I hope to do today is just to very describe very quickly what that actually looks like. More recently, we've become a catalyst for things like hiring initiatives across, the, across departments. So that we work with the uh, President's Council on Equity and Diversity, which has in, inaugurated the cluster hiring initiative. And lo and behold, the center becomes the kind of the, the energetic center for organizing some of these initiatives. Uh, and as I, from the very beginning, we, we hoped that, in, that one of the byproducts of this conversation would be producing truly collaborative research, and I'll get to that at the end as well. So for instance, upcoming we have a session that's uh, run by political scientists, uh, scholars in human ecology, uh, and others looking at um, you know, the structure of governance in the United States, the federalist system, the relationship between the federals, federal government and the states, and the way in which that shapes and really and shapes racial inequalities. Um, so it's really about governing inequality, race, and ch the challenge of American federalism. We also do graduate student forums, the same opportunity we hold open to faculty for meeting annually we have graduate students uh, organize, uh, who are affiliated with our center, I'll talk a little bit about them, uh, organize graduate forums where graduate students repeatedly come together to talk about, you know, work in it. And not surprisingly, I find that what we learn is that we're all involved in pretty much a very similar academic enterprise. Some of the questions, the methodologies are different, the language is different, but the enterprise often is very much the same. And so, as I said, it starts with the effort to draw Rutgers faculty and students into sustained conversation about contemporary issues in race, ethnicity, and public policy. And I want to give you an example of one of those contemporary issues. You might remember that during 2008, we had a presidential election. And in the course of that presidential election, there was all of this discussion 
about race and gender. Does gender trump race? Does race trump gender? Uh, just before the uh, vice presidential debate, this was a, a Wall Street Journal story that says Biden prepares for Palin with eye on gender pitfalls. And it was all about, you know, how a man debating a woman has to be very careful and how it's going to work out for him. Um, in January, of course, the story had been quite different. It was about Clinton and Obama and gender race debates. Uh, what's okay to say and is it okay uh, uh, tougher on women than on minorities? By the mid, in the midst of all these primaries, there were supports, uh, articles like this, Hear Her Roar, Gender, Class, and Hillary Clinton. Um, and of course, there were debates about age as well. Uh, is John McCain too old? to be president? Is he going to die in office? So all of this is sort of circulating. And so what does the center do? Well, just a couple days, actually, it was actually the day after the vice presidential debate. We organized a cross-disciplinary roundtable discussion among Rutgers faculty on the role of identity and images in American politics. And the premise for our, for our meeting was that each of these candidates are not simply running against each other, but they're also running against stereotypes. And that was the title of our session, Running Against Stereotype, Race, Gender, Age, and, in, and Politics 2008. And as I said, the argument here is, you know, what is a stereotype? Stereotypes of race, age, and gender have defined this year in American politics. Candidates for national office running not only against one another, but also pushing against and reworking public ideas about what it means to be a woman, what it means to be black, what it means to be old. So here's this cross disciplinary conversation, and we have a scholar in the Eagleton Institute for Politics, uh, the, the director of it, um, uh, a women's and gender studies scholar who's a political scientist, a scholar from the School for Journalism and, and, um, and Communication who's a media studies specialist and a historian, but also a psychologist who works on stereotype, how it functions, how it doesn't function, what we know about how stereotypes work, and then finally a political scientist. It was a thrilling conversation. Now, as we all know, conversations last as long as people are in the room and what happens with it next. It was really, really interesting. We've done this with a lot of events, whether it's the race, ethnicity, and the subprime mortgage crisis. So in, in many ways, what we try to do is to respond to and engage with unfolding issues uh, in the public realm. We've also done sponsored films for students. Students may be interested in politics, but they are, they're also interested in seeing movies and having pizza. And we use that as a way of engaging them in conversation, um, whether it's showing Crash or uh, Mississippi Misala. Um, we deal with global issues in race and ethnicity as well. So for instance, the plight of the Roma gypsies across Europe and what we can learn about ethnicity and race in the context of economic downturn and uh, national transformation. Uh, this is also, and what I find interesting is in, t in putting these roundtables together, I was talking to people last night, is that I'll often have two people who work on a topic and I'll say, who else works on this topic? And I end up Googling my own campus, Rutgers, race, Roma. And lo and, lo and behold, I discover that over there in European studies, there's a scholar who's written a book on this topic. And up in Newark, there's a, another scholar who's at work has published an article on this. And, and this is what the convening process is. It's, so it's not exactly as if I'm, when you say transforming the university, in many ways what we end up doing is, is revealing the university to itself, pulling people together who are here and who actually may not even conceive of their work as being focused on race and ethnicity. Um, but in fact, when they are brought into conversation, they see those as the lines through which each of us can explore and have a common conversation about our work. But what we do is also, we produce newsletters. We publish the results of these conversations. And I think that's one of the things that we've really tried to do to make the impact of these conversations last longer. So here is the newsletter, which you can find on our website for the Running Against Stereotype, Race, Gender, Age, and Politics. Now, these are not you know, peer-reviewed publications. These are, but, but, and, and they're, but nor are they transcripts. They're somewhere in between. And so I'll talk a little bit about the process by which we create these. We have affiliated with the center in any given year, anywhere between five and seven graduate students from multiple departments. 
some of, most of whom are funded from the provost's office, well, the vice president for academic affairs, and some of which are affiliated with me and my research. And they help to conceptualize these events. They help to plan them. They help to organize them along with a senior program coordinator. And then the week afterwards, we sit and we talk about what was meaningful and important about what was said and what was unsaid and how this should be written up. And one of them usually, excuse me, takes charge of writing up this, which is a, a three-page newsletter, uh, which highlights major themes, uh, for instance, and pulls out key quotes. So Ru Ruth Mandel saying, you know, based on the study of women in politics, we know this. She says, those who assume that women will vote for McCain because of Palin are uninformed about women's voting patterns. Like other groups, women vote according to issues and partisan preferences, not the gender of a candidate. So really, I mean, what's interesting about this forum is that faculty are prompted to sort of bring very pithy observations to bear on a question. The other thing we do about it with this forum, which is really key, is you know, there's a joke about faculty that they can talk for an hour and 20 minutes, 50 minutes, uh, in 20 minutes, well, we go with the five-minute rule, which is we say, essentially, you have five to seven minutes to convey what you want to say on this issue. One, two, three, four, and then we go to discussion, because it's the discussion that really brings out all of these implicit observations about the issue at hand. So I guess the key to the, what we've done is to, to find the issues that we want to bring faculty together around to stage it in such a way that to give people um, an opportunity to talk and discuss, and then to convene afterwards to write it up and to publish. The impact of this has made my life a lot easier because before we went to publishing these, I would run into somebody on campus and they'd say, so what's going on over there at the Center for Race and Ethnicity? And I'd have to spend a lot of time explaining. But now I publish this and people say, oh, it's really great what you're doing over there at the Center for Race and Ethnicity. And then they bring their agenda to the center. So what I'm sort of arguing is that this is the if you build it, they will come model of building a center. But also you have to advertise it and you have to make it something that even though faculty can't make it to the event, they feel virtually as if they have attended these events. Um, as I said, so it's really about a wide range of ways of structuring engagement across departments, disciplines, and schools. And it also involves a kind of a regional component as well. Because we're a state university and we're very deeply intertwined with politics and culture and life in New Jersey, not surprisingly, we, we also have a faculty who are deeply engaged in using New Jersey in some way as a lens through which they advance their own scholarship. So it's not very difficult for us to put together a session like this one that we did called Between Privilege and Poverty, Perspectives on New Jersey Disparities, which highlights a simple truth, which is New Jersey is one of the wealthiest states and has some of the wealthiest counties in the nation, but also some extraordinary pockets of poverty that rival anywhere in this country. And we wanted to sort of talk to faculty across the disciplines about how they understand this in, through the lens of their own research. So we brought together a faculty member from the School of Law, David Trout, who works on housing policy. New Jersey has a very strange way of kind of encouraging small, there's a very powerful sense of local control. And, but it also has this desire to encourage communities to build moderate and low income housing. But it also allows them to buy their way out of that responsibility. And David Trout works on that. How to bring him into conversation with Sharon Ryan, who works in the Graduate School of Education on the Abbott School Districts, and the fact that New Jersey also has innovative ways of trying to build model education programs for underprivileged kids. As well as the director for the state Center for State Health Policy, who studies the state from a different perspective, looking at health, et cetera. And what was interesting about this is that what they all realized is that we're talking about a very similar phenomenon of you know, the haves and the have-nots, and policies affecting them and shaping this this kind of uh, geographic and economic profile, but that we never talk to each other across these realms, education, health, uh, housing, uh, public policy, and then criminal justice, which is what Lisa Miller works on. And this has become a, a sustained conversation. This not only produced one newsletter, but it produced a follow-up conference, which expanded to areas like 
climate change. Um, and, we, and, and this, I would say, is going to be an ongoing concern. Now, what this will result in is not yet clear. But the point is, as we do a call for papers or a call for submissions for the next New Jersey conference, we find ever more groups of faculty who are interested. And they're creating their own clusters of interest. As I said, we use the five to seven minute model, and it has to be policed very, very, very strictly. I mean, that's all I'd have to say, is that you know, the capacity of people to uh, run over time, like uh, I think I'm on time so far, is really um, legend. Uh, as I said, we're, we're using, we, we go from New Jersey, but we also are trying to deal with global issues in race and ethnicity. Uh, one of the most successful uh, sessions we did early on was one called Ethnic Conflict and Comparative Perspective. That's not this one, this is a more recent one, where we basically asked scholars who work in Eastern Europe, people who work in South Africa, people who work in Abkhazia, uh, those who work in, um, in Newark, who study the Newark riots, what are the factors that shape ethnic conflict and cause them to become inflamed or cause them to, resol to resol be resolved? And what role do outside forces play in either aggravating or alleviating these conflicts? And lo and behold, all of these scholars came away from this roundtable thinking that we were all working on a very similar project. And I guess that's what, I'm trying to, what we're trying to encourage here. Uh, similarly, the politics of language is another the theme. Now, the center, on the basis of building and convening these meetings, has also become a catalyst for innovative teaching, by which I mean sometimes these roundtable discussions build to, uh, con connect two faculty in such a way that they say, well, you know, we, we actually should maybe work together or teach together or collaborate in some way. And so out of one of the first sessions on criminal differences, race, ethnicity, and American justice came a collaboration between Lisa Miller, a political scientist and a sociologist named Paul Hirschfield, who two, two years later really taught a course called criminal issue, criminal, Critical Issues in Race and Criminal Justice. It's a course that could not, that is listed in each of their departments, but could not be taught by any one of them singly. And because of the way we develop it as well, it's a course that really you could not find anywhere else in the curriculum. And I want to explain a little bit about what I mean by that. Uh, I, met, I alluded to the fact that we have graduate students. Well, what we did was we affiliated them, the graduate students, we affiliated these two faculty with the center for a fall semester to work on developing the syllabus. And what's interesting is that when you have a graduate student in media and journalism, talking to a political scientist and a sociology professors about teaching criminal justice, the student in journalism or media studies says, well, you know, maybe you should use a, um, an ep that episode of The Wire that, that, that they showed recently, which really, and the political scientist says, oh, really? So what is that? And then she describes how to use it in a course. And before you know it, she's actually teaching the section of the course in the criminal justice course. And that's really the way this course developed. It became a kind of a collective undertaking. The syllabus is a reflection of the work of the Center for Race and Ethnicity. Um, this year, we're actually doing this for a new course on race, ethnicity, and film. Uh, and this is going to be an, uh, an annual thing where every year we teach a new course where we're trying to kind of break apart uh, and really transform undergraduate education. Uh, we've also tried to do simple things like document who teaches what at the university that intersects with our agenda, uh, to collecting syllabi and organizing them on our website. It's a lot of work to do this, and I think this is maybe about a year old, uh, the, the syllabi that you find there. But faculty find it useful. They find it useful as a resource for their own teaching. Um, but as, as I said, you know, the central role pl is played really by graduate students in this new enterprise. Um, it also becomes a catalyst for graduate education. As I said, there are five to seven students affiliated with the center, and we run it like a, a weekly research group where uh, there's not only the work of the center that's done in these weekly research meetings, but critique and exchange of our own scholarship. So I've circulated chapters of my own work in this research group setting. The students have, they've circulated job letters, they've talked, circulated abstracts for conferences, and it doesn't matter that we have political scientists, sociologists, journalism studies scholars. The point is, we all know what a good job letter is, or should know what a good job letter is. Uh, we know what a good abstract is, we know what you need to do to, you know, when you're submitting a paper for a conference. Yes, the the norms and the methodologies are going to vary, and I'm not an expert on all of those, but I can give good advice about writing, 
And I think this is really what the center has become, a center where um, some of this information is more freely exchanged. And in fact, I feel at liberty to exchange, to, to offer more advice, I would say, to students who aren't in my discipline, right? I mean, because they don't have to take it, right? They can do, they, they, they talk to their advisors and their advisors tell them don't pay any attention to him. But generally speaking, it's, it's, it's good advice. And the students also have written a newsletter about this process. So there's not anything that happens in the center that doesn't get documented, written up for broader consumption. So we publish this about, you know, it involves, it's about productivity, intellectual community, and the weekly research group. But it also involves advice for graduate students, uh, broadly defined about how to make it through your graduate career, all shaped by the conversation at the center. Now, we couldn't have done this without support from the president and the vice president's office, as well as from deans. And we happen to have a president, Dick McCormick, who isn't just doesn't give lip service to the goals of diversity, but he you know, actively goes out and develops it. So he and uh, one of our colleagues in English, Cheryl Wall, are the co-chairs of the president's, um, president's Council on Equity and Diversity, which has really created this new initiative to try to engage with what is, in fact, one of the most diverse student populations in any university in the country. Um, and you know, the debate, the, what we do is we take those debates about diversity, let's say, and we try to create academic programs around it. So one of the, one of the uh, round tables we did recently was on, does difference make a difference? Uh, and, and it's really to kind of move beyond the idea of diversity as a political buzzword, to look at the diversity as a concept. And I guess one of the things I would say that a center like this does is it takes terms like race or diversity that we all think we know what it means. And then we actually have to come together to talk about it and advance our understanding in this way. In this instance, we had a professor of English. We had a professor from the philosophy department. We had a professor from the business school, uh, as well as a molecular biologist for all of whom study in one way or the other diversity and have something to say to it. And what came out in the newsletter was a far more rich understanding of this than I think any one of us anticipated. In fact, I would say to, to a round table, there is not one single round table that I've attended. Uh, every single one I've attended, I come away thinking, that, that was just amazing. Like, I had no idea, one, that we had this range of people here at this university. And two, I, I really didn't understand the complexity of the issue. So I don't go in thinking that I know the answer. I come away thinking, how are we going to write this up? And how are we going to collect this in a way that can be meaningfully conveyed? So in a way, what I'd say is that one of the center's role turns out to be addressing basic questions of cross-disciplinary communication, terminology, and understanding of basic concepts like diversity. One of the things that came out of this newsletter, for instance, is the professor from the business school, Nancy Di Tommaso, said that diversity of thinking is actually essential for innovation in the business world. She also noted that innovation is critical for the long-term competitive success of companies, but cautioned that diversity has both these positive as well as negative effects. So this is not a place where we come to kind of champion diversity, but to really think about it as an intellectual program. She says, research and management, for instance, has shown that diversity of thinking enhances creativity and problem-solving abilities, spurring greater innovation. But diversity also contributes to conflict, reduced cooperation, and decreased job satisfaction. And that is the challenge in business, in academia, and elsewhere. Right? The, Molecular biologists had a very different view of diversity, uh, biological diversity as essential, and yet was fundamentally skeptical about translating what we know about biological uh, systems to social systems. He's like, you know, uh, he's very cautious about that slippery slope between sort of, you know, of sociobiology, right? Um, but that was what made this a fruitful conversation. Now, let me just say, last comment about the, um, the center's origins and its continuing role in academic scholarship. Uh, I mentioned that first year in 2006. One of the things that we did, in, in addition to having a faculty forum where we just said, who works on what topic in race and ethnicity, come and let's talk. And, let's, and we also asked people, what would you want to see a Center for Race and Ethnicity do? Um, we, we also have, I should say, um, a kind of a balkanized campus where ethnic studies has 
become, you know, we have an Africana studies department, we have a center for, we have a department of Latino and Hispanic Caribbean studies, we have a Jewish studies department, and we really saw the Center for Race and Ethnicity is not competing with, but really advancing the conversation and bringing all of those entities together. We also wanted to talk about uh, one concrete issue. And so we organized a, a March 2006 conference on Katrina, where we asked faculty, which was obviously a recent event, and we asked faculty to come together to sort of share their ideas about Katrina, and we organized a one-day conference. And people really wanted to kind of vent, to talk about it, to see it from, tell you what, they, what it looks like from their perspective. That became a long-standing conversation that next year is producing, after a long transformation, an edited volume that really is a reflection of, it's, it's Rutgers faculty reflecting on the importance of Katrina in time for the fifth anniversary of the event. And it focuses, I, I can't say that we started by focusing on vulnerability, but when you look at the participants from sociology and human ecology, from health policy, from planning and public policy, from law, from um, economics and planning and public policy, from management and labor relations, it gives you a sense of the complexity of the conversation. And it also gives you a sense of that we realized, for instance, in the first half that there are these various dimensions of vulnerability that really explain Katrina. Uh, they had to do with environmental vulnerability, transportation-related vulnerabilities, uh, healthcare-related vulnerabilities, and this issue of federalism in relationship to the states. And so the first four essays in the volume really try to understand the tangle that is vulnerability. Once again, it's a, the commitment of the center is also to producing these edited works. Uh, because I wanted to make sure that, as I said, that the legacy of the center isn't just, God, that was a great discussion last week and I go back to my work, but that you have some visible, tangible byproducts that emerge from that that then become, in this case, this is, this is, this is volume one in a series that we call Rutgers Studies on Race and Ethnicity, being published by Rutgers University Press. So this gives you an example of what the center has been doing. We are working actually on a second collaborative book, uh, this time not with Rutgers faculty, but with faculty elsewhere, uh, which is called Genetics and the Unsettled Past, the Collision Between DNA, Race, and History. I'm working with a colleague of mine at Rutgers, Mia Bay, a sociologist at Rutgers, Catherine Lee, and Alondra Nelson, who's now at Columbia who, in sociology. Uh, we continue to do what got us here, but we continue to also discover that, you know, the, in a way, this is a top-down and a bottom-up process, and I'm just in the middle trying to kind of, you know, keep things moving, I'd, say, I'd put it that way. One of the goals is to advance a global and regional understanding of these particular issues in race and ethnicity. So it's not race and ethnicity uh, in the abstract, it's race and ethnicity as reflected in, you know, that cartoon about Obama race and ethnicity debates as reflected in this particular debate about criminal justice or racial profiling uh, in the modern world um, and spanning as many disciplines as possible. We're interested in, uh, what I found fascinating is that the write-up that you did for the Race and Difference Initiative sort of, you know, I, I didn't have to reach for my talking points because I saw us as doing very much what you're doing yourselves, generating a culture of collaboration on multiple levels. When I started, I wouldn't have imagined that one of the levels would be, let's say, undergraduate and graduate education. That's not, was, that was not one of the plans going in. I just wanted to kind of create conversations. But one of the impacts has been, uh, undergraduate and research, undergraduate graduate teaching, research collaboration, and new teaching initiatives. Uh, we've discovered ourselves because I think people have been bringing their agendas to the center now, working with departments and schools on innovations in teaching and research, as well as these new cluster hiring initiatives that have um, really, the center has become the place where you go to to organize these sorts of activities. Uh, and then, I, as I said earlier, in many ways, I think ultimately the goal of what we're doing is um, based on a fundamental model, uh, a fundamentally a distinctive model. And I like to joke that a lot of centers are organized around the idea of finding somebody who lives more than 50 miles outside of town and bringing them in and having them bring slides, right? That's what an expert is. And, and, then, and then you try to create community around that. And of course, you know, I'm here, so I can't. I can't, you know, dismiss the idea, right? And, and we do a little bit of that, but I think we, we don't want to do that uh, without doing the 
work that's necessary to create our own intellectual community. So really the driving force behind our center has been trying to find the scholars on our campuses who, who are often asked to go elsewhere to be an expert and create a community for some other university. And what we find is that it's, it's really cost effective. <laughs> and we serve lunch, right? And a secret is that we often are never asked to speak on our own campus. And I can't tell you how many times people have said to me, you know, this is the first time in 10 years that anybody's asked me to talk about my work outside of like this unit where I'm affiliated. It's just stunning, right? And so I like to think that we've kind of discovered a secret, um, which is that you know we have experts on our own campus, and if we just bring them together in a particular way, really interesting new pathways in understanding race and ethnicity can develop. So that's really what um, I wanted to talk about, and uh, hopefully uh, there's time for questions. I think I stayed within my 35 minutes. Great. So thank you. Today for this panel on current research on race and difference, we will have Carol Anderson, one of our newest colleagues from the um, Department of African American Studies, um, Joe Crispino, um, who is Associate Professor of History, Michael Owens, an Associate Professor of Political Science, and Tyrone Foreman, an Associate Professor of Sociology, and they will each speak for about 15 minutes and then we'll have time for questions. So um, we'll begin with Carol Anderson, thanks. Good morning. Um, and I'm going to have to cut out a little early because I have class to teach, but I'm not being rude. I really do have home training. <laughs> when I was working on my first book, Eyes Off the Prize, and I'm sitting in the Library of Congress, and I'm going through all of these NAACP boxes, I started seeing something that told me that 40 years of research told me was not supposed to be there. And you know, as scholars, we are naturally nosy. <laughs> and I'm real nosy. And so I peeked in one of those boxes when I was supposed to be working on the first book. And what I found was the NAACP fighting, and fighting very hard for colonial liberation, to free African and Asians from the yoke of imperial rule. Now, 40 years of scholarship told me, uh-uh, this does not happen. Because what the scholarship says is that the NAACP in 1947, with the turn of the Cold War, cut a deal with the Truman administration to get some civil rights concessions here in exchange for putting this powerful, organization with 500,000 dues paying members on the side of imperial rule and US Cold War foreign policy. Now that is really a damning indictment when you begin to think about it. Because here you have the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People actually being in league to suppress the rights of people of color. And that has been the dominant theme since the early 1970s in terms of historiogra the historiography of uh, the NAACP and anti-colonialism. Now what that has done is, is that it has collapsed uh, a very complex world as scholars have looked at this. Because what the scholars have said is that while the NAACP walked away, I mean walked away, like see ya, wouldn't want to be ya. <laughs> In fact, it says then it was the left, Paul Robeson, W.E.B. Du Bois, the Civil Rights Congress, Louise Patterson, whose records we have here in marble, that it was the left that rose up and took up this cudgel, took up the battle for people globally. And I thought, whoa, but when I peeked in that box and there was this letter from Abdullahi Issa from the Somali Youth League that said, Thank you so much for all of your help in battling to keep the Italians off of us in the UN. We so appreciate everything you have done for us. I said, ooh, this isn't walking away. And that's where this journey for bourgeois radicals, the NAACP and the struggle for colonial liberation, 1941 to 1960 began. 
because one of the things that has happened in this literature, so part of the work that I had to do, so I'm gonna try to just walk you through the work of doing this work. Part of it was trying to figure out how we got here to that. And I began to understand it because when the first piece was written, the NAACP records weren't open. And so it was coming from what was emanating from the secondary literature, from the newspaper accounts. And part of what was coming from there was the eloquence of W.E.B. Du Bois. And I love Du Bois. But Du Bois had just been fired from the NAACP. And so his pronouncements on what the NAACP was and wasn't might be a little slight, you know, skewed. What this has also done in terms of understanding what has happened in the historiography, it has constricted our understanding of change. Because if the left, as the historiography is written, if the left is the only one fighting for social justice, then we don't understand how political transformation actually comes about when we have excised this enormous political center that is in the African American community. And because part of my work deals with what does it take to create systemic change. And so if we have excised the center, I, I, I liken it to trying to make cookies without flour. Stuff doesn't hold together. It's all runny and it's just it's ill-formed and you can't quite get your hands on it. You need the center to hold this thing together to figure out what happened. And what we also don't get is how do you fight? Because remember, this battle is happening at the height of the Second Red Scare, at the height of McCarthyism, where folks are being dragged under guilt by association. If you look like you're fighting for anything that the Soviets just might even be interested in, then you too must be a communist. So how do you fight for colonial liberation when the Soviets have said they're for colonial liberation and do so and not get creamed? And we know that the NAACP didn't get creamed because they're celebrating their 100 year anniversary this year. Whereas the black left got destroyed in this moment in time, destroyed. So how do you fight for your core values, maintain your integrity, and still survive in a very hostile environment. That's what I set out to find out. And to give you a quick piece of this story, because I know I only got 15 minutes, <laughs> and I could go on for about 15 hours, um, is that, so on one of these pieces, I, it was multi-archival research. You weren't going to find this story sitting solely in one archive, or even two. In fact, I had to go to 26 different archives with almost 150 different manuscript collections to pull this story together. Let me give you a quick piece of the story. One dealt with Channing Tobias, who was the chairman of the board of the NAACP and a US delegate to the United Nations. They put him in charge of what was called the Fourth Committee that dealt with trusteeship issues. And Walter White, the head of the NAACP, said to him, so how'd it go? And Channing said, sometime a man got to do what a man got to do. And I went, oh, what did you do? Nothing is left in the NAACP records about what he did. And I'm telling you, this is an organization that dotted its I's, crossed its T's, and marked down when you sneezed. And there's nothing in the records about, except sometime a man got to do. And I said, oh, you don't get away from me that easily. Hopped a plane, went to Minnesota, where his records were. I'm going through the records, beautifully documented, get right to that moment where a man got to do what a man got to do. Boom, silence in the records. I said, oh, it must have been really good, because you excised this before you, you turn these papers over. Hopped on a plane, went to the National Archives, got into the State Department records, which are voluminous, right? And I'm hunting, and I'm hunting, and I'm hunting, and I'm hunting. Finally pull up, and it says, hmm, this is probably the only existing copy. The British are furious with Channing Tobias. It looks like Sir Anthony Eden will be calling Secretary of State Dean Acheson just thought you should know, period. I said, oh, no, you do not get away from me because you really have done something. Now, hopped a plane and went to Britain. <laughs> oh, yeah. Research grant money helps a lot. <laughs> and there sitting in the British National Archives is a folder on Channing Tobias, 
the British were furious because he scuttled a deal that the British and the Americans had cut to protect South Africa in the UN dealing with the issue of Southwest Africa, current day Namibia. This is how the NAACP fought. They fought within the inner sanctums. So you didn't see it out there. You didn't see it in the press. They, were, they figured out how power moved, how it worked. And there they were dealing with those levers of power and influencing folks and scuttling deals. And part of the reason, part of what I had to get to was the rationale behind the NAACP. Because remember, I'm weighing up against 40 years of literature on this organization in the global struggles for freedom. And I began to understand that not only were they staunchly anti-communist, but they also understood the degradation that raw capitalism brought to folks. And they said that when you have these colonies emerging into nationhood, you have to do so based on a human rights platform. A human rights platform that recognizes indigenous control of natural resources that recognizes land reform, that creates a system of education, that creates a system of health care, that creates viable living wage jobs. A human rights platform is what sustains society. It makes it vibrant and viable. Because if you don't have that, then you don't have justice. And that you will get political extremism, you will get violence, and you will get this never-ending cycle of war. That's the NAACP in 1945, 46, 47, 55, 1960, all the way through my study. Very clear, without human rights, the global system will be in chaos. They took that vision with them and weighed into the battles dealing with, as I said, Namibia, but also Eritrea, Somalia, Libya, Kenya, Tunisia, and Indonesia. And so I asked myself, after I established what they had done, I had to figure out how were they able to do this? Because this was the McCarthy era. And there were, and it's a good thing that I have five things that they were able to do, because I've got five minutes. First was the nature of the NAACP itself. Its anti-communism gave it some modicum of protection against the McCarthy witch hunts that were destroying Paul Robeson and the Council on African Affairs, destroying William Patterson and the Civil Rights Congress. That modicum of protection allowed them to maneuver within the inner sanctums. But their sense of the idea of America and their sense of justice also gave them the kind of integrity where they didn't fall into the abyss the way that the other black communists, Max Juergen had done, where he became the, the black champion of apartheid and white uh, minority rule in Southern Africa. The second factor was that the United States was ambivalent about being a colonial power. It didn't see itself as a colonial power the way that the British did. In fact, it saw itself more as a caretaker and turned to say, we, we uh, gave the Philippines their independence in 1946. See, we were just caretaking. We're not a colonial power. Now, the British were scared. Winston Churchill's talking to Eden, and he's going, I don't know if we're going to be able to, quote, rely on the Americans to keep Negro Africa in its place, unquote. Well, the NAACP saw that, too, and used that ambivalence to breach what looked like the citadel and in fact was instrumental in helping help the, the Truman administration cut off Marshall Plan dollars to the Dutch as they were waging their battle to regain control of Indonesia. The third factor was the United Nations itself. The UN became this incredible hub of anti-colonial activity led by India on which the, United, uh, the NAACP, uh, Nehru was a lifetime member of the NAACP. I mean, this was a, a, a fusion of watching the United Nations, India, the Afro-Asian bloc really begin to assert its authority in this area. The fourth factor was the creation, the NAACP created a lot of transnational linkages with organizations in New York, Geneva, Cape Town, London, and Mogadishu in order to wage this battle. This is the side, you know, it's, there was an old Ford commercial, this isn't your daddy's Ford. <laughs> this was a very different kind of NAACP than the way it has been conceptualized for us. 
And ironically, the fifth factor was the Soviet Union. Because the Soviet Union, and, I, and the way to understand this as well, because I think this also gets to the issue of what we understand as the global north and the global south, is that you have human rights and anti-colonialism emerging at the same time in space, but yet they took very divergent paths. The reason I believe is that on one hand, you had the major powers, the US and the Soviets and the British did not want to see human rights darkening the globe's doorstep at all because they all had their issues to deal with. On the other hand, when it came to colonialism, the Soviets are ambiv the, the US is ambivalent, the Soviets are looking at this as a great issue by which to just beat the crap out of the West and they're like, yes. And so you hit the Soviets aligning their bloc with the Afro-Asian bloc in the UN, and you begin to get the power to move on the issues of decolonization and changing the terms of debate, where having colonial empires no longer makes you a great nation, but folks are looking at you like, what's wrong with you? you know, and that's that shifting of the terms of debate. Finally, I think, but, but as I said, that divergence is what helps us understand the North and the South, the global North and the global South. What also I think this battle does, I got about one minute, <laughs> what also I think this battle does is I, I'm also looking internally at what the NAACP's internationalism meant for this organization as it started moving into the civil rights movement, the traditional civil rights movement. Um, because what I'm seeing is that it's internal battles about how to wage this war as it's having so much uh, pressure put on its resources is that it weakened the organization as it was moving into the civil rights struggle and the way that the NAACP fought behind the scenes within organizations didn't create that kind of spectacle of public martyrdom that we saw with Robeson, that we saw with Du Bois. And so the black power leaders as they're looking at the NAACP see a dinosaur. They don't see a vigorous organization that's, that is conceptualizing global justice. And this is what leads us, as I said, to um, where the black power leaders were high on rhetoric and short on reality when it came to linking the freedom struggles in the United States with the global freedom struggles. But through bourgeois radicals, we wouldn't know any of this except by um, beginning to re-put in, to re-link the black political center in the diaspora and the freedom struggles. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Aren't we glad Carol Anderson came to Emory? <laughs> I'm excited about Carol being here and excited about being here this morning with y'all. Um, thanks to the uh, Race and Difference Initiative for putting this together, for reintroducing or introducing, allowing us to introduce each other to ourselves again um, in a way that Keith talked about. And thanks to Keith, too, for your really um, stimulating remarks. I think there's uh, a lot to be learned from what you guys are doing at Rutgers, and it's exciting to hear about that uh, program. Now, the title for my talk today is Strom Thurmond and the Long Civil Rights Counter Movement. And the title riffs off a uh, well-publicized piece written by Jacqueline Dowd Hall at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill called The, uh, the Long Civil Rights Movement. Uh, this was a piece that she uh, wrote as part of her presidential address at the Organization of American Historians. And last spring, she convened a conference at Chapel Hill, uh, bringing together scholars working on this concept, of thinking about what it means to write a, a long uh, civil rights movement history. We're kind of you know, moving the origins of the, of the movement back from 1954 into the kind of struggles of the 1930s and 40s. And in a way, scholars have been doing that in different ways before Jacqueline Hall made that call. But for my purposes and, and to my mind, what was important about that piece and that essay is really moving the history of the civil rights movement uh, into our own era. You know, uh, that, we, that we can't think about the civil rights movement ending in 1968 in Memphis with the 
with the uh, assassination of Martin Luther King. I'm from a very small town in Mississippi, and, I, and my colleagues have probably heard me say this before, but you know, in the town where I came from in Mississippi, the Civil Rights Movement had not ended in 1968. Civil Rights Movement hadn't even gotten there in 1968. <laughs> and it wouldn't get there until the 1970s and 1980s, the election of local black officials, and into the 1990s. And so I grew up in a town in, a, in the rural South that was very much still polarized by racial issues, in which the, the, the legacies of the Civil Rights Movement were still very real. And that very much informed my first work, and I think it informs my second work as well, which is a political biography of Strom Thurmond. Now, uh, let me just tell you briefly the, uh, the argument of the, uh, of the book. It's, it's, there have been several biographies about Strom Thurmond, some written by journalists, some written by um, kind of partisans. Um, no one has really gone into his records, to, uh, into his archives, into a, uh, to a great degree. Uh, but, my, but mine's not a cradle-to-grave biography of Thurman. It would be a long book if that were the case, certainly. <laughs> but it is an, it's a biography with an argument. And the argument is this, is that uh, uh, we oftentimes see Strom Thurman, and we think about Strom Thurman as, as one of the last of the D Jim Crow demagogues, one of the last of the Dixie demagogues. And, and that's for good reason. He was the, president, uh, the presidential candidate of the Dixiecrat Party in 1948. He was the lead author of the Southern Manifesto in 1956, which protested the Supreme Court decision in Brown versus Board of Education. He filibustered on the floor of the Senate for 24 hours and 18 minutes in 1957 in protest of the 1957 Civil Rights Act, which still stands as the longest speech in Senate history and is also in the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest speech ever, longest single continuous speech given. And so his record of opposition, his record of massive resistance is clear. But what we forget about Thurman, and I think of what I want to restore in this biography, is that Thurman was not merely one of the last of the Jim Crow demagogues, but he was also one of a handful of pioneers in the post-World War II in post-war II American politics, one of the handful of the pioneers of a Sunbelt conservative politics that would be very important in reorienting national politics in the closing decades of the 20th century. Now, sometimes when people hear me say that, they think that what that means is I want to clean up Thurman, that I want to take him out of the South and put him into the Sun Belt and not talk about his racial politics. But it couldn't be uh, more untrue. What I want to do is, I think, by, by talking about Thurman in terms of the history of, uh, of the Sun Belt, I think that uh, in the history of modern conservatism, too, I think we need to put him in that trajectory, into that narrative of modern conservative history, because conservatives themselves are quite reluctant to, to place him there, right? Uh, if the kinds of, of histories that conservatives themselves write about modern conservatism tend to be intellectual histories. And, and that's, not, uh, that's not surprising, because there are lots of really fascinating kind of contrarian conservative figures from the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s that are fascinating to write about. But the crux of that, of, of that uh, scholarship, that kind of intellectual history of modern conservatism, is it leaves the impression that basically kind of conservatism wins because they had better ideas than liberals, right? And they just kind of outthought this kind of sclerotic New Deal liberalism that kind of didn't have any new ways of dealing with public policies and that kind of thing. And, and, uh, and I don't think that's true. And I think that what we miss a lot in the history of modern conservatism is simply the political history of it. You know, how, you know, conservatives didn't win because they had better ideas. Conservatives won because they got more votes, right? And they, and they won more power through the electoral process. And how they did that is a story that's very much implicated uh, with racial politics and regional politics, but not just regional politics. And that leads me to the second reason I want to write this book. It's not just about complicating the history of, of modern conservatism, but it's also about challenging notions of kind of sunbelt innocence, that when people who have written about the sunbelt, and, and of course I'm, this is a term that comes from Kevin Phillips, who was the pollster for Richard Nixon uh, in 1968, and, when, and wrote a very influential book published in 1969, The Emerging Republican Majority. And he talked about the, this, this collection of, 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 of political and economic interests spanning from the former states of the Confederate South through Texas and Arizona into Southern California. That was the Sun Belt, right? And the history of that, of that region often gets told in kind of distinction to Southern history, that the Sun Belt emerges in the 70s and 80s, and it's different from old line Southern politics because you don't have the old segregationists like Strom Thurmond, you've got these new figures, and race is not operating in the same way. 
And, um, and there are a lot of, there's a lot of really good, interesting scholarship that's come along that's challenged that. But it's still a, a, an issue that is contentious among scholarships. You still have histories of, say, uh, an area like um, Orange County, California, a very important book in kind of the modern and in this kind of scholarship of modern conservatism, modern Sunbelt, uh, a book by a woman, uh, a scholar Lisa McGurr, who uh, teaches at Harvard, who wrote about uh, Sunbelt conservatives in Orange County. And she makes this distinction at the beginning of the book and she, uh, between kind of the people that she's writing about in Orange County and the kind of, uh, the, you know, the kind of racists from the Deep South, the conservatives like Strom Thurmond and others. And, um, and she draws this, this, this line of distinction. While I, th I, I certainly think there are you know, distinctions that can be drawn, I think there are a lot of similarities as well. And, and that's what I want to try to do is kind of restore that history of, of all those times that Strom Thurmond went out to uh, Southern California and spoke to different citizens groups out uh, in Orange County and other areas. And certainly you can't really tell the history of, of Orange County, California and the suburbs that were developing there absent of a story about uh, racial politics and the way that race function in, in, the, uh, in the racial in the creation of the racial isolation of modern American suburbs. So it's about complicating conserv modern conservative history. It's about complicating too this notion of Sunbelt innocence that we get in a lot of the literature. So how do you write? Uh, so what what do you um, what would I do to kind of stretch out you know Strom Thurmond's Sunbelt? What does that look like? How do you how do you write that history? Um, I, I've got three ways. That, I'm, this is breaking it down. It's more complicated than this, but you know, you have 15 minutes. Um, so one way is to rethink the history of uh, the Dixiecrat run in 1948. There are important things that we forget about Strom Thurmond's presidential uh, campaign in 1948. One of the first things we forget about the, uh, the Dixiecrats is their name. Uh, they were not uh, called the Dixiecrats. The press called them the Dixiecrats. The official name was the States' Rights Democratic Party. And Strom Thurmond always hated the name Dixiecrats. He hated it because he thought it, was, it, was, it reduced the party to a mere regional revolt, uh, that it was just about the South. And he said, this is, these are issues that affect all Americans. He hated it, too, because it, you know, he, it, it, it implied that it was merely about racism. He was saying, you know, you know, it's about states' rights. And he wanted to put it on the kind of grand you know, constitutional issues of the relationship of power between the federal government and the state governments. You know? So it, you know, what we forget about that name Dixiecrats is that it, within it, it contains a political argument that by using that term, we settle it ourselves. And it was very much still alive and it's very much still contingent for Strom Thurmond at the time in which he was running. Um, so it's important to, uh, to, to remember that. I mean, I don't think that's all that we need to say about the Dixiecrats, but it does put, a, put them in a slightly different light. The other thing I would want to say about the Dixiecrats is that um, when we think about the economic issues that contribute to uh, the rise of the Sun Belt, we think about things like the creation of the Cold War state, you know, National Security Council Resolution Number 68, that puts the United States on a permanent war footing in 1950 and leads to the rise of this military industrial complex that is located a lot in Southern California, in Texas, in Florida, in, Hun in uh, Huntsville, Alabama, and, 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 in, uh, and also in Aiken, South Carolina, Strom Thurmond's hometown with the, the building of the Savannah River uh, site project. But before the creation of the, of the military industrial complex, the first uh, industry that was uniting the South and the Southwest in a kind of common economic logic, connecting states as diverse as California and Texas and Louisiana, was oil and gas. And, and one of the things that we forget about the Dixiecrats is there were real suspicions in 1948 that the whole Dixiecrat movement was being funded by um, by the oil and gas industry because the issues of, of this vexing issue of the Tidelands, which was a big issue in post-World War American, World War II America, who had control over these areas just off the coast of California and Texas and Louisiana, and who would control the mineral rights in those areas. Um, so, you know, rethinking the Dixiecrat, there are other ways I could do that as well. I want to spend a lot of time, not a, you know, a significant amount of time in this book talking about Strom Thurmond's anti-labor politics in 1950s, uh, when, where he sat on the human uh, welfare and labor uh, committee in the Senate alongside Barry Goldwater, and those two men developed a very close relationship. That's a story that we don't know about Strom Thurmond's politics. It's very important. I also spent a lot of time talking about his anti-communist politics, and always the way in which race is reflected in his anti-labor politics and in his anti-communism politics. Uh, there was a, there's a very famous series of incidents that have all but been lost to 
uh, certainly Southern historians and many historians of anti-communism, these hearings in the early 1960s that Thurman actually instigated uh, and which were very, uh, received a lot of attention at the time, allegations that the Kennedy administration was muzzling the military, that the State Department and the Defense Department was cracking down on military officials who were kind of calling out uh, the fact that the United States was in a, was in a real uh, showdown with the Soviet Union uh, and were not you know, participating in the kind of temporizing language of the Kennedy administration. It was a real flashpoint in the early 1960s for, uh, around which kind of popular anti-communist right-wing organizations like the John Birch Society organized. And Thurman was a key figure in that. And we forget that history entirely. And he traveled all across the Sun Belt in the early 1960s, giving speeches before anti-communist rallies in Southern California, in Dallas, in Arizona, in Memphis, in Arkansas, all these places, you know, talking about these issues. And the way those were inflected in his racial politics is very important. But I don't want to, in this book, take Strom Thurman so far out into the Sun Belt that we forget he was from the South, right? And not just any place in the South, but he was from South Carolina. Carolina, you know, that place about which it has been famously said that it's, uh, it's too small to be its own sovereign nation, but too large to be an insane asylum. Um, you know, Strom Thurmond was a proud Southerner, and his, and his story is very much wrapped up with the story of the transformation of the South in the post-war period. And, and Strom Thurmond uh, figures in that narrative in interesting ways. I think there's a way in which Strom Thurmond's chain, you know, well chronicled you know, evolution on racial politics. You know, the fact that he started courting black voters in the 1970s when he realized that he needed to, to do so to win, uh, gets folded into a larger narrative that we tell about the South, about the, you know, the kind of the redemption of the South using that terminology, not in the same way they used it in the 19th century, but, but people use it about the, the way the South was, was kind of became, uh, oddly enough, a place that became a, an emblem for other places around the country. By the 1970s, school desegregation in the South uh, had, had taken place, and Southern schools were more desegregated than, than and certainly schools in Boston or Detroit and many other places around the country. Uh, African Americans started returning in historic remigration to the South in the 80s and 90s. And then you also had these handful of incidents you know, of, of examples where people like Strom Thurmond, old racist dinosaurs, started, you know, changing their tune on race and trying to recruit, uh, um, trying to win black votes. Now, that's part of a mythology, right? And, the, and, and it's interesting to understand that, how that mythology works, because Thurmond, uh, if you ask people, uh, even, you know, scholars, political scientists, historians, you know, how many votes Th Thurmond was winning, how many black votes Thurman's winning. They, they, you know, they estimate much higher numbers than he actually won. The most he ever won, he won about 22 percent of the black vote in 1996. That's his highest mark ever. And by that time, you know, he's kind of a South Carolina institution. He was just kind of running to, to win the longevity record of the longest serving senator. But, uh, but there are other ways, there are other legacies of Thurman in, in terms of Southern politics. Thurman was the, the, the kind of father, godfather, grandfather, whatever you want to call it, of a generation of Southern uh, of white Southerners who came of age, whose political consciousness was formed in the fires of civil rights conflict. People like Joe Wilson, people like Lee Otwater, people like Trent Lott, and also people like Caton Dawson, who is the current head of the South Carolina Republican Party today. And you might have, have recognized his name because he was the finalist for a um, for the head of the National Republican Party, uh, he, he Michael Steele beat him out narrowly, and uh, there's a great story I would tell about uh, Kate and Dawson, and and I think it, it it is emblematic. I think this story of how long the civil rights counter movement runs, but certainly we know other examples of how the legacies of race can continue to inflect Southern and national politics today. Uh, and so it's important to, to put Thurman into that uh, larger narrative as well. Thank you. Good, uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's still morning. Uh, so in 2000, I was invited to an open house. And the open house took place at a federal correctional institute. Uh, why would a federal correctional institute have an open house? Uh, because it built a new wing. And with regards to the new wing, they wanted to show off the new wing. They wanted to show off the wing to new staff, staff who were around the country, also friends and family of staff who worked there, and maybe even to some of the inmates who were at the facility. Um, I took a tour right, while I was there. And one of the things I noticed on being on one of the cell blocks 
was that there were all these men, mainly African-American men, sitting around watching television. Um, but there was no sound, right? The TV was up there, and they had headphones on. And that's a, a matter of kind of control, right? Because you want quiet, so that you can kind of pay attention to what they're doing, even though quiet can be used against the guards as well. And I asked a really silly question. I said, well, um, who decides what they watch on television? And the tour guide said, well, they do, of course. Why, why are you asking this question? I was like, what do you mean they do? They're prisoners. He was like, they do. I said, well, how do they do that? He told me that they actually have their own representatives. And I was like, representatives? They're like, yeah, they have like, their own representatives or shop stewards, whatever you want to call them. They get together, and they represent the interests of the different sets and sub-segments of the, of the population. And I was like, wow, this is amazing, you know? Political science, I'm like, representatives, representation <laughs> in prison. And I had this crazy idea. I was like, oh, I'm gonna study democracy in prison, right? <laughs> and I had this idea that I was gonna call it the prisoners of democracy, right? <laughs> to suggest that even in um, a situation of full control by someone else, there still are, still are elements of democracy at work. And then three years later, I was invited to uh, an event at the Annie Casey Foundation talking about incarceration and some other things. And at lunch, I was seated at a table where I was the only person at my table who had never been incarcerated. And so they asked, well, what do you do? And I started telling them, like, yeah, and I've got this great project. It's called the Prisoners of Democracy. And you know, I'm going to be really inside the prisons, figuring out where democracy is and how it works. And they looked at me like I was crazy, <laughs> totally crazy. They explained to me that you know, um, if you'd have asked us when you had made that visit, we would have told you something different that what's going on in the prison is more like dictatorship than democracy among the groups. But they said, but if you really want to understand, right, the kind of connection between prison and democracy, you should focus on what happens to people when they leave prison. That that's where you should really be thinking about things. And so that conversation really influenced um, at least one of the projects that I'm currently working on that I want to share with you today, or at least some, some elements of it. And so uh, today I'm just going to talk kind of briefly about uh, deviance and difference. I know we're here to kind of think about race and difference, but I want us to also think about this notion of deviance and difference as well. And I'm just going to share with you some initial uh, work that I'm doing on a project that's still called the Prisoners of Democracy. Right. So one thing we know about uh, the United States is that we have been on uh, an incarceration binge. Right? At least since the beginning in the late 1960s, definitely through the 70s, and really exploding in the 80s, because in particular, crack cocaine changed reality, both at the neighborhood level, but also in policy venues as well. And I like to think about um, our nation in terms of incarceration is that in many ways we're like a bulimic, right? Because we're binging on bodies, and we're oftentimes binging on particular types of bodies, right? Uh, black bodies, brown bodies. But we also then purge them, right? People come out. But then we take in more, and we constantly keep doing this, right? And so if we really want to think about um, crime and corrections in the United States, we need to stop just thinking about the prison population and think more about the correctional or the corrections population. Because when we think about the corrections population, that means that we're also thinking about felons who actually aren't in prison, right? They're out in the streets. And actually, right, some of them are ex-felons. I tend to not use the phrase ex-felon. Because in reality, for most felons, they never are ex-felons, right? We even have some of these felons here at Emory University, right? Among our students, among administrators. Well, I don't know about administrators, but uh, <laughs> some staff. And I don't know about faculty. <laughs> A Freudian slip, Freudian slip. <laughs> anyway, uh, if we think about the corrections population, the one thing we know is that the majority of people who comprise this population are actually not inside prison, right? They're either on probation or they're on parole. All right. With regards to who's under correctional control, though, this clearly allows us to initially begin to think about race and difference, right? Because I said we're consuming all of these bodies. What we know is right now, right, one in every 31 adults in the United States is somehow caught up <laughs> in the correctional system, right? Probation, parole, jail, or prison. The other thing we know, however, is that that's just like in the aggregate, but we can think about it in terms of race, right, and ethnicity. So for whites, it's one in 45, Hispanics, one in 27, blacks, one in 11, right? And even though we know that there's this one in 31 nationally, in a place like Georgia, we're talking about one in 13. And this is one of the places, in fact, where Georgia ranks number one, <laughs> right? Number one. The other thing we know, too, though, about 
blacks and the correctional, the correctional control population in the state of Georgia is that we're talking about one in nine, right? One in nine, okay. So I just wanna say a couple of things about this idea that felons are deviant or deviant polity members. And a basic way to think about any members of a polity is that social construction is gonna be important. And so we can have one dimension where we think about the social construction, how we kind of perceive someone positively or negatively, but we also need to be paying attention to political dynamics, right? So we can think about political resources, right? Where they have a great store of political resources or a smaller or even non-existent store of resources. And if you do that, and if this works, then we can begin to categorize, right? People or members of polities. And this is, um, what I'm talking about is informed by um, two political scientists, Ann Schneider and Helen Ingram, who began to kind of encourage political scientists to think about the social construction of target populations. And what we see is we then know that people who have lots of political resources and lots of social construction, we refer to them as kind of the advantaged, and we think about the middle class and family farmers and all of that. Other folks who have a lot of um, social, positive social construction, but who might have fewer political resources, we consider them to be dependents. So we think about disabled kids, we think about Native Americans, particularly those on, on reservations. Then we have folks with limited social construction, but lots of political resources. We call them contenders, and we think about CEOs and bankers and insurance companies, and even environmentalists kind of fit into that category depending upon the person talking about them. But then we have one last group, right, that have low political resources and negative social construction, and we refer to them as the deviants. And these shouldn't be surprising labels that we normally associate with deviants, right? So we think about black welfare moms, and when we think about them as deviants, we use the phrase black welfare queen, um, illegal immigrants. What I'm really interested in, though, are felons, right? And what we know about the, um, this idea that the correctional population is really a population of people outside of prison, that means that we need to be thinking about the reintegration of felons. I have it in uh, parentheses, the re part, because for some of the people that I'm interested in, they were never ever integrated into society, which partly accounts for why they were in prison in the first place. Or at least that's my normative take on what's going on. And so I think about it being a question of access to opportunities post-felony conviction. And we know that reintegration is an option Right? Whereas reentry is not. Reentry means that people are released, and people are released all the time, and there's really nothing we can do about it. They've served their time, they get released. Reintegration is different, though, right? In terms of actually creating opportunities for people to connect up to resources that will foster their social mobility. Reintegration then means that it's within our control, right? To actually shape public policies and shape even our kind of private decisions and how we respond to uh, felons. And that ultimately, reintegration, if we're ever to achieve it, at least positive reintegration, requires what I refer to in the shorthand as the ABCs, right? Assistance to felons or ex-felons, benefits being available to them, in particular public benefits, and then this larger notion of citizenship. But we know that the reintegration of felons, however, is actually hindered by what we can call punitive policy designs, right? That states and even some municipalities create that actually restrict or hinder um, the ability of felons to access any opportunities that would be available to any other citizen, right? And it might also, to some degree, affect public attitudes. All right, we have a freeze going on. In. There we go. Um, this is just to give you an illustration of what we mean by how uh, there are states that have punitive policy designs, right? We know that with regards to policies that states pass, that can affect how felons get to live their lives after prison, there's great variation among the states, right? And so all you need to take away from this map is that the states that are coded orange are really good states, right? Good in a relative sense. That if you were a felon in this state, your likelihood of reintegration is actually a lot higher and better than if you were in the states that are kind of dark purple, if you will. And again, you notice that Georgia is uh, dark, dark purple. It's not quite number one, but it ranks number three in terms of like the number of barriers uh, that stand before felons when they get out. Uh, shifting gears very quickly. So we can think about just asking the public, right, how they consider the place of felons in politics. And we can come up with a really basic question, right? Do you agree or disagree? Felons who serve their time should return to society as full citizens with rights and privileges. And I don't know if you can really see it up there, but the one thing that we, we see here is that actually, the majority of the public would express a degree of agreement, right? That this is supposed to be a good thing. So 52% of Americans would fit into the category of agreeing somehow with this idea. But we can also unpack this by race and begin to explore whether or not there are differences among the population. 
And for most of the slides I'll be presenting today, all we really need to do is focus primarily on the strongly agreed category, right? Because these are people who really have expressed their either tr their real true support for this notion. But here we see a glaring difference, right? 59% of blacks strongly agree with this idea of full restoration of citizenship, whereas only 19% of whites. We can, and that was at the national level. But we can maybe decide to look at, say, cities and see if we see differences, right? If we go down uh, the, the Federalist ladder. And so here in the, in the city of Atlanta, I asked the question a couple of years ago of uh, population, felons who serve their time should be treated by the government as full citizens with rights and privileges equal to those of people who have never been incarcerated. Uh, what we see here is that um, most people, at least in the case of the city of Atlanta, agree with this state. If we try to look at it by race, it becomes uh, kind of interesting. Uh, with regards to strongly agree, we see that African Americans still, right, tend to really support these ideas more so than other groups, but at least in a place like Atlanta, which is deemed to be more progressive, um, less punitive, we shouldn't be surprised that we also see um, large proportions of whites and blacks thinking like this as well. We can also, um, what am I doing here? Let me just fast forward. Okay, yes. <laughs> we can also, though, ask people um, to make distinctions among types of felons to see whether or not there are particular types of felons that we think should, should be allowed access back into uh, the polity. And uh, a couple of things we can take away from this slide, right? Um, and here people were asked to just think about four types of felons, if you will. And one thing we see is that Generally, we think, yeah, we, the illegal stock trader, the white collar criminal, yeah, welcome them back, no problem, right? Uh, interestingly, illicit drug sellers as well should be welcomed back from how we think about this. Murderers, uh, you know, uh, we're not too, too cool about the murderers. And sex offenders, we definitely don't really want them being connected back into society for all sorts of reasons. Um, and what, what we generally see, though, is that there's not much difference among how different groups of people think about felons when we break them into particular categories, although there is the kind of interesting finding that for um, Latinos in the city of Atlanta, much higher proportion would be in favor of allowing illicit drug sellers back into the community. And even with regards to sex offenders, we see a bit of a difference there. Um, access to public benefits by felons. So let's say that you are a drug felon. You've been convicted of a drug felony. Uh, you may or may not have gone to prison when you get out. One thing you might need, particularly if you're a woman and you have children, is access to temporary assistance to needy families, welfare. Well, again, depending upon the state you're in, you may or may not have access to TANF, along with food stamps, as well as public housing. And so this comes from a, a national survey asking people, do you think people convicted of crime should lose access to public benefits only while on parole and probation, or people convicted of crime should forever lose access to public benefits? And here, I include the category of don't know, because I'm really fascinated by the don't knows, right? Because that means that there's actually a, a relatively large proportion of people who might be open to influence on this issue. But if we think about just the bottom section about the racial groups that are in favor of felons actually losing their rights forever, right? So forever, they would never again be treated like someone who's never been incarcerated. Uh, we see some differences here. Uh, that eight, only 8% 8 of African Americans would, would respond to this as being the way to think about public policy. But that's not true for whites, which is at 27%, and Latinos at 24%. Other ways that we can think about this idea of restoration of full citizenship. So we can ask people, do you agree or disagree? Someone who has committed a felony should be allowed to, and then just you know, put into that to a number of different things. And this comes from a survey of the state of Georgia, statewide. And Georgia's really interesting, right? Because I told you, Georgia has one of the highest correctional control populations. Georgia also has one of the highest rates of incarceration uh, among the United States. And Georgia is one of the more punitive states, but it's also a state that's beginning to be a little bit more progressive, progressive um, but mainly because, not because there's been like a change of heart or anything, uh, because of money, <laughs> uh, because of money. And so uh, Georgians were asked the question, right? Someone who's committed a felony should be allowed to blank. Live in public housing. This is a very interesting finding, the first one, in terms of strongly agree. There are those who would have, some would have argued that we should have expected to see actually more African Americans believe that um, these folks should be allowed back into public housing, but you see that it's only 45%. 
Because generally, we think about who lives in public housing, we think about African Americans, and a lot of folks in public housing don't want these people coming back, right? Don't want them to have access. And if we think, looking at the vote, right, returning the right to vote, here we also see a big distinction, right? That for blacks and Latinos, they overwhelmingly support the idea of restoring the franchise to felons. So uh, to conclude, what I would like to just say very simply is that uh, what my research is now trying to do is to really understand you know, what might be influencing some of these differences that we see. Um, I suspect that some of it might have, be an issue of social proximity, right? That people who are either live around lots of ex-felons or people who have family members who have been incarcerated or who are felons might have a different way of thinking about a number of these policies. We can also think, of, think about uh, spatial proximity, right? Um, and really, if you are in an environment where there are lots of people who are on probation and parole, maybe that will influence how you think and respond to these questions. Um, and then the final thing I'll say that I'm, I'm working on is really trying to understand that even though we can label felons as deviants and assume because they are negatively constructed and they have limited political resources, we should also be trying to explore those cases where felons actually use their deviance right, as a form of resistance and try to understand how some felons are actually trying to force and compel society to reintegrate them positively after prison and after felony convictions. Thanks. Good morning, <laughs> again. <laughs> uh, I'm going to share with you some work that I've been doing uh, related to the constructs of race and class. Um, uh, one of the things related to residential segregation. One of the things we know from the literature, sociologists, demographers, is that we remain, even though there are many parts of our social lives that are integrated today, both um, in the South but also nationwide, uh, there are a couple of contexts that we remain stubbornly segregated. One of those is the church, for which I won't talk about today. <laughs> You'll have to come uh, hear me talk about that another time. But the other is neighborhoods, the communities we choose to live in. Um, and so what I want to talk about is how we tease out how we understand what leads to the persistently high levels of residential segregation that we see in our communities across the United States, but clearly in our major metropolitan areas. And there really are kind of three kinds of approaches to this, or three explanations that people provide. One is that there are racial and ethnic differences in economic social, uh, uh, economic status, and so therefore those who are um, poor tend to not be able to afford communities that have better schools, lower crime rates, and unfortunately in our, in our society that's aligned or correlated, as social scientists talk about, with race. Um, the available evidence on the role of social class as an explanation for high levels of residential segregation is fairly clear that even when you account for the racial and, or ethno-racial differences in social class standing, that it doesn't account for the high levels of residential segregation that we see. The other that's clear, and there's lots of compelling evidence, and I won't talk about this explanation today, is the role of discrimination. In particular, the role of steering, um, and there's increasingly work being done on mortgage uh, discrimination. Again, I'm going to set that to the side, in part because I think if you sort of, if we were to walk outside this room and go on to North Decatur Road, and ask someone, just pick someone randomly and ask them, why do we have such high levels of residential segregation in Atlanta? They would say, well, it's because people choose to live around their own. And in fact, 
ironically, this is an area that has received lots of social scientific investigation. That is the role of neighborhood preferences. And so what I want to talk about today is the question of preferences. And generally, uh, social scientists have talked about this as benign ethnocentrism. That is, birds of a feather flock together. And this hinges upon two empirical findings. One, that African Americans when asked uh, what kinds of neighborhoods they want to live in, they typically choose neighborhoods that are 50% their own race and 50% other. So they pick communities that are kind of 50-50. In contrast, whites, when asked these questions in social surveys, pick communities at most that have somewhere around two in 10 of the population being African American, right? So the question is, with those polarized neighborhood preferences, no wonder we have the levels of segregation that we have. Now, there's a critique, and that's really what I'm gonna focus on today, of the evidence that leads us to this conclusion that African Americans choose 50-50 neighborhoods whites choose neighborhoods that have a token representation of African Americans. In part, the critique comes from how we draw this evidence. There's something called the show cart technique that was developed by colleagues at the University of Michigan, Howard Schumann and Reynolds Farley. And what they essentially do is they give a card to the respondent, like the one you see on this slide, and they ask them to choose the neighborhood they desire. Now, What's clear about this work or the body of evidence that draws upon this uh, 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 show card, as it's called, is that it presumes in some ways that one of the only factors or the most important factor that people choose uh, or think about in choosing the neighborhood is race. And so the one critique has been that in fact we're overestimating the impact of race because we know people care about schools, people care about safety, people care about social services available in those communities, and you're not providing that kind of dynamic uh, portrait. Well, people have tried to address this issue, um, and they've tried to address it in a number of ways. I'm just going to talk about three here today. One is to sort of ask the question, well, really what's going on is race is a proxy. And if you just look at the lower um, uh, uh, description, the bottom description on that slide, it comes from a colleague named David Harris, who essentially developed this idea called the racial proxy thesis. And essentially what he said is that in fact, race is operating. When we find in these studies that race impacts uh, whites' preferences for neighborhoods, what we're really doing is we're not adequately measuring social class and the social class characteristics of those neighborhoods. Now, in response to that critique, he did a series of analysis that showed if he uh, looked at neighborhood satisfaction, whites' neighborhood satisfaction, and he related that to the racial composition of those neighborhoods, what he found was as those neighborhoods became more African American, white satisfaction with their neighborhoods declined. But once he controlled for the safety, the perceived safety of those communities, the social class characteristics of those communities, he was able to totally wipe away the impact that race had. And he said, aha, it's really about social class, it's not about race. And there have been two responses to this approach uh, by David Harris. One by colleagues uh, Larry Bobo and Camille Zabrinsky, in which they essentially take these show cards, and what they try and do is add a variable that they think is important. That is, what are whites' perceptions of racial and ethnic differences in economic standing? The argument being that really the problem, the critique was, that in the studies that David Harris had done, questions of perceptions of safety, perceptions of crime are imbued with race. And so to add those to a model 
and, and be able to account for the impact that racial composition has on people's assessments of the satisfaction of those neighborhoods, you really have what social scientists like to call an endogeneity problem. That is, you can't tease out the effect of race and class in the kinds of models that David uh, presented in his study. And so what they did, that is Camille Zabrinsky and L Lawrence Bobo, is they replicated his analysis and included in there the perceptions of racial and ethnic differences in economic standing. And what they found was that in fact, racial composition no longer impacted these people's assessments of the neighborhood, but negative racial stereotypes did. Now, one could critique their model because they also hinged upon these show cards. And so a colleague at Rice, Michael Emerson, did a study in which he attempted to do a factorial design. That is, he attempted to take seriously David Harris's critique that when people choose neighborhoods, they're not just looking at race, they're looking at a range of other characteristics. And what he asked a, a representative sample of respondents uh, in the Houston metropolitan area was looking at this show card. Imagine that the community has very good schools low crime rate, um, what else, uh, great services, that is your, your, your recycling is picked up every week, um, that's an inside joke for Atlantans. Um, <laughs> how would you choose uh, the neighborhood? And what they essentially found was that in fact race impacted whites' preferences for neighborhoods. Now, this is sort of where the debate lies. And what I'm interested in doing with some colleagues is really trying to take another assessment of this question. And I want to do it by invoking the kind of factorial design that Michael Emerson and his colleagues at Rice uh, drew upon, but take a slightly different approach. That is, I think there's a high cognitive demand <laughs> on a respondent who's called on the phone that says, okay, look at this show card. The social class of this community is X. The crime rate is Y. Give me an assessment, right? It doesn't create what we talk about as mundane realism. And so how we try to get around this question is we take the same approach but show people real neighborhoods. That is, what happens when people look at real neighborhoods, not a card, with sketches on them, but actually real neighborhoods, and you subtly change the actual individuals they see in the neighborhood. That is, it's the same neighborhood. The only thing that changes is the actual individuals you see in those neighborhoods. So let me quickly jump ahead and tell you about what we did. We surveyed roughly 800 respondents in Chicago and Detroit, um, and we showed them a series of video clips. Those video clips um, look something like this. Let's see if this works. Uh, yes. So they looked at a neighborhood. This panned for 20 seconds. Um, they saw individuals walking in those and uh, uh, around the community. And the only thing that changed was the actual individuals they saw. And I have a series of these, but I won't belabor the point with you. Uh, I can send you the files. Uh, you can look at them yourself. And we, so we showed them neighborhoods that had African Americans in them, neighborhoods that had whites, and then neighborhoods that had an integrated, that is blacks and whites. Let me jump ahead. So what did we find? One of the first things we found was that uh, social class matters, that is, across white respondents in our two surveys, they found neighborhoods more comfortable if they were upper middle class um, or middle class. And in fact, there's not a meaningful difference between the last two bars there. But let me jump uh, quickly ahead to the question of, are whites in Chicago and Detroit colorblind or color conscious? And what you see from this slide here 
is that in fact, whites in Chicago and Detroit are much more likely to find neighborhoods as desirable if those neighborhoods are, uh, if they saw the whites in the video. Uh, and they're least likely to find them as comfortable or desirable if they saw African Americans. The question becomes, what underlies this? And what we attempted to do, and I'm just quickly jumping ahead here, is we asked them a series of questions, because this was a survey after all, about their, what they thought about African Americans. That is, were African Americans more likely to um, keep up their neighborhoods? Were they more intelligent? Were they more crime prone? And what you find in this slide basically is as whites endorse more negative stereotypes, they're much, uh, they're much more likely to feel that those neighborhoods are less desirable. That's the why, or comfortable, find them comfortable. Um, but those uh, whites who actually uh, saw the white videos, there virtually is no effect between stereotypes and their assessment of those neighborhoods in which they saw the whites. Similar question, is it about wanting to be around your own group? This is a question about in-group identity. What we essentially find here is that whites in Chicago and Detroit are much more likely uh, to be sensitive if they have strong in-group identity. That is, they, they want to, they'd rather be around whites and feel really close to whites than they do to African Americans. So in short, Based on this innovative study in which we uh, embedded in a social survey and experiment, we found that whites' neighborhood preferences are not just about social class, but they're also about race. That is, whites in Chicago and Detroit are sensitive to neighborhood racial composition, even once we can just for the social class characteristics. They're more likely to be sensitive to the racial composition of the neighborhoods they viewed if they hold negative stereotypes of African Americans and have strong uh, in-group identity. Um, so at least on the small question about whether or not race uh, is really a proxy for social class, at least from our study, it's clear that it's not a proxy for social class. Thank you very much. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.